Chem 201, College Chemistry 1, <clears throat> Chapter 7, Atomic Structure and Periodicity. In this particular chapter, we will continue with the atomic theory. We <clears throat> go back to Chapter 2, in which we were studying the models of Thomson, Rutherford, about how the atom is organized. Right? So the very last model that we were studying was from Rutherford who with his uh, goal for experiment he demonstrated that the atom is uh, has a nucleus which is which mostly <clears throat> contains most of the mass right of the of the atom and the atom is mostly empty so that emptiness he associated it with electrons he didn't say anything about electrons and that's exactly the goal or what uh, this particular chapter will try to emphasize is that how are electrons uh, organized? So for this, we will learn two more models. One of them is the most important and the last one, the quantum mechanical model of the atom. But before that was Bohr, who also, he gave basically the foundations for the quantum mechanical model. So remember that we are talking about 1910s, 1920s the, of the last century, so it was, was really the, the glory of the, of the atomic model. So they were all working in radioactivity, uh, electricity. So all those uh, instruments were basically available to investigate about the atomic structure. Okay? So we will then uh, study the quantum numbers. Um, quantum numbers is about uh, electron organization, orbital shapes, orbitals, and then how the electrons are organized. Basically, this is about organization of the electrons. And then at the very last, part, the third section of the, the, the last third section of this chapter is about the properties of the elements based on the electron configuration. So the electron configuration provides some properties uh, to the atoms. So those atoms, as we will learn here, they will give some periodic trends. Apparently, the, uh, the electron organization has a periodicity, that's why it's called a periodic table, periodicity uh, on the elements. And so we will learn about uh, atomic radius, um, affinity, electron affinity, and energy of ionization. We will also expand it a little bit that uh, atomic radius to the ionic radius. Ionic radius is really seen on chapter eight, but since atomic radius and, and ionic uh, atomic radius is they are so similar, so they, they basically they have the same foundation. So we will incorporate ionic radius in this particular chapter seven. Okay. And then we will end the chapter with properties of the alkali metals, so which are the most reactive metals that we have in the periodic table. Those are going to be studied at the very last part of this particular chapter. Okay, so <clears throat> let's start with electromagnetic radiation. And then this is really like the intro for this atomic model from Bohr and then the quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics, then there are, there are many scientists, uh, that's why there is really no last name to that quantum mechanics model, because it was really the contribution of a lot of scientists. We have Albert Einstein, we have uh, Pauli, we have Offball, uh, we have uh, Schrodinger also who study about, so that's why the, the last model, which is called the quantum mechanics, doesn't have a last name. So it's not a person that really developed everything. It was really the contribution of many scientists. So everything started, right? So after Rutherford, so it came Niels Bohr. Niels Bohr, a, a brilliant scientist, one of my favorite scientists I also have uh, in chemistry. Um, he studied the light. Light was one of his, his most important curiosities. And then he, he used the light as a source of energy and then it was created by elements. So for example, if you, for, if by any chance you guys have made, have been cooking or made pasta, and then all of a sudden the water from your pot, right, when you were making the pasta overflows, you will see that the flame uh, will turn like a really intense yellow color. So normally the flame of the gas, right, from burning on the stove is normally a blue, has a blue color. But as soon as sodium chloride goes into the flame, now it turns a really bright yellow color. Why is that? Same thing as fireworks. Fireworks are really a lot of metals inside of the fireworks. Once they explode up there in the atmosphere, it, it gives you those bright colors. So, so that's what Niels Bohr started to, to, to work, uh, to really study. So what are the colors? So how do we get colors? Uh, 
how, uh, why do we different chemicals give us different colors? That's exactly the example I was telling you about sodium chloride from the pasta that gives you like an intense yellow color. Uh, copper gives you like a green, like a, a turquoise uh, color. Green, blue color more or less. Potassium gives you like a, a purple, a light purple. We have calcium give you an orange. We have lithium that also give you a, a red color. Uh, different elements, they give you different colors. Okay. So those are the, the things that Niels Bohr and then some other scientists back in 1910, 1920 were wondering, like, why are, why are these colors associated with different elements, right? So if theoretically, according to Rutherford, so the nucleus is the one that is condensing most of the mass, and the, the electrons are floating in this empty right, shell of the atom. So how come this, this should be something? Because there is really no... Something in the, with the electrons, since Rutherford didn't really explain much about the electrons, was mostly focusing on the nucleus. So these new scientists, they were wondering mostly about that to complete the idea from Rutherford. Right? So since he didn't talk anything about the electrons, let's investigate all the electrons. And that's how all these curiosities came from this color, color and the different uh, colors uh, from chemicals. So... <clears throat> Electromagnetic radiation, so radiation, well, it's really light, right? So they call it uh, is a radiation because it's irradiated from the sun. Our main source of energy is the sun, right? So it provides us with all the light during the daylight and also the, well, energy, right? So a lot of, there's a lot of initiatives to trying to convert the solar energy into electrical energy because there is so much energy that is provided by the sun every day, nonstop that uh, is being wasted. So we were trying to catch with it, always developing new materials that are able to trap the solar energy in a more efficient manner. Uh, why is it called, uh, called electromagnetic? Um, because it has two, two fields. It's electrical field and the magnetic field. So really the, the light moves in two, in two waves. So one is the electrical field and the other one is going to be the electromagnetic field that they both move perpendicularly. I know that right now my drawing doesn't make any sense, but it is two fields that move simultaneously. The electromagnetic, sorry, the electrical and the magnetic field. That's why it's called electromagnetic radiation. That's what we, we, re, we receive here in all, or that exists here in the planet. So is, uh, the electromagnetic radiation is one of the ways, right, that energy travels through the, through the space in the form of light, right? So there's three characteristics as any, any electromagnetic radiation. So it has wavelength, it has frequency, and it has a speed. Okay? So where is that, or, or how could we define each of them? So the wavelength is the distance between, between two peaks of, uh, or throws, uh, in a, throws in a wave. So for example, let's say that here I have a wave. This is an electromagnetic radiation, a really ugly wave, but that's my wave. <laughs> So the wavelength will be the distance from this point to this point. Okay, let's say that I have a, another type of electromagnetic radiation like this, this electromagnetic radiation. So now in this case, the wavelength will be from this point to this point. Which of the two electromagnetic radiations in this case would be more aggressive or more energetic? I would say that this one on the right side. So in other words, the shorter the, shorter the wavelength, the more aggressive, the more energy it has, okay? Because there are more repetition, that's exactly what we call frequency. Frequency, uh, which it has the uh, abbreviation of nu, is this a Greek letter, this is no B. Okay, so don't confuse frequency with B. This is the Greek letter nu. Same thing for, wave, for wavelength is lambda. Lambda is the Greek letter. Uh, that's the abbreviation for wavelength. So frequency is the number of waves or cycles, right? So how many waves are going through a specific point uh, a given in, during, a given, during a second, right? So for example, if I place my eye, if I play my eye right here, right? Let's say I'm looking to the wave here. So if through this point pass three wavelengths, right, three waves in a second, so that would be equal to the frequency. Three divided by one, three, that would be the frequency. If it's a thousand, well, the frequency would be a thousand. Okay? So it's the number of waves or cycles per second. The speed is the, the velocity at which the electromagnetic radiation moves. And normally, 
Okay? So the speed of the light is a constant. It's three times 10 to the eight uh, meters per second. That is in vacuum. Obviously, if you have, let's say, light here at the, at the, at the sea level, it's not going to move at three times 10 to the eight because here we, are not, we don't have vacuum. Right here we have air. The air contains oxygen, nitrogen, dust particles, right? Uh, we have carbon dioxide, we have moisture, humidity. So definitely those things are going to slow down the velocity of the light. In London, it would be even worse because it's so foggy in London that definitely the light is not going to allow you, to, I mean, it's not going to allow the, the light to travel so fast. So if we're talking about vacuum, right? So we, we could even say like um, uh, in, outside the universe, right? Outside of Earth, um, then you will talk about vacuum because it really is supposed to be no, no particles, no matter in that particular um, that particular environment. Okay, so we continue here. There is a formula that connects the speed of the light. Okay, the speed of the light is equal to wavelength times frequency. Okay? So remember that 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 formula. Is a uh, wavelength times frequency. Uh, wavelength would be in meters, um, right? Because the unit for C is meters per second. Therefore, the unit for lambda or for wavelength would be meters, and then for frequency would be one over second, right? So that would be the unit for both of them. So that's the example of wavelengths. You can definitely see that out of the three waves that I see here, definitely the most aggressive would be the one in blue because I have, have a shorter wavelength. So it will be an intermediate in the green, and then the very weak one will be the, the, the first one, the red wave, because the wavelength is way longer. Okay? So here is the electromagnetic radiation, is the spectrum. So in this particular case, uh, we will see all the radiations that exist or, or that we have, we experience here in Earth. So. The first one, let's start with the most, the most aggressive, is called the gamma rays. The gamma rays are the most, let's say like, uh, hazardous, right? Is that the most negative uh, type of wave? Well, if we apply it to our bodies, because the wavelength is so short, you can see 10 to the minus 12, right? The wavelength is so small, that it's very aggressive. So you can, basically it would be like a wave like this, it's very, one after the other, one after the other. Radio waves, no, the radio waves, which are the weakest, they are 10 to the two, that means 100. So it's 100 meters between wave and wave, there is 100 meters. So it's very, it's really weak, this particular radiation. Okay, so we have gamma rays, 10 to the minus 12. Then we have X-rays, which are also very aggressive, uh, 10 to the minus 10. Then we have ultraviolet, which is for coming from the sun. Visible light, which is the one that our well, our eyes can detect. So that's why here we have the seven colors of the rainbow. We have uh, purple, we have blue, we have indigo, we have green, we have yellow, we have orange, and we have red. Okay? So those are um, those are the seven colors, right? So purple, blue, indigo, green, yellow, orange, and red. Those are, and then uh, even in, in those, in that particular range, you can see that the red light is the weakest, right? 10 to the minus seven, like seven times 10 to the minus seven versus four times 10 to the minus seven. That's why the red light, I don't know, you have, have been in a room that has the red light, uh, or in the old, all years of the photography, normally you were able only to develop the films, right, of a, of a camera, in a room that has a red light. Have you ever wondered why is, why is that? It's a red light that it, it has to be used to not, let's say like ruin your, your film for the old cameras. It's because the red light has the smallest energy, right? So it's the weakest, has the, the longest wavelength. If you have the, uh, the longest wavelength, it's not, gonna, it's not gonna affect, it's the weakest, so it's not gonna affect your film. Your film is light sensitive, so, if you have to do something like sensitive, well, use the weakest radiation that you see, but you, that it will still allow you to observe, right? Because red light, you, our eyes can detect it, so we can definitely see through the red light. But it's so weak that your eyes get very tired. I don't know if you guys have ever wondered why in red light it is really, it's a tiring light. Yeah, definitely not. Okay? 
So then the blue and the purple is too strong. So it's the opposite. So that's why most of the streets or, or maybe the most common color for us to see is the yellow because the yellow is right in the middle. The yellow color is not so strong. The yellow color is not so weak. So our eyes fit perfectly. So why light bulbs are yellow? Why are the street lights are, right? the lights on the streets are yellow? Because they are, that's, that's the one, but our eyes, they are really not getting too tired and they are also not getting too, right? The light is not so aggressive to our eyes. Um, talking about the x-rays, uh, we can see that normally we use x-ray for for uh, bone, right? Bone treatment, even for lungs, uh, even for dental, right? Dental treatments. So it is not recommended to use it so often, right? So even the, the radiologist, this is a health scientist or, or a specialist, they even have to be very careful. They wear some tags. I don't know, you have seen for the ones that are familiar with these uh, professionals, but they wear a tag on their chest. That tag measures the amount of radiation that they receive every day. So that tag is taken by the hospital or the institution. They take it to control how much energy, how much radiation that particular employee has been exposed to. So if he has been a, ra a high radi radioactivity, then definitely radioactivity, not radi radiation, that means that that particular uh, employee has to take a break, has to take a rest, they, they make some recommendations about uh, that particular employee to, uh, to prevent any damage of the x-ray. Normally the damage for the x-ray is not superficial. Well, definitely you can get some burns on your skin, but the damage is mostly at the DNA level. So then you know that the DNA level is very silent, and then you will only see the effects when it's too late. And when there is the, the DNA has created some mutations, and then those mutations, they, they tend to create tumors, and then the increased cell division, which is called cancer. Same thing with UV. UV light is actually a, a less aggressive, uh, radiation that x-rays but the difference is that you were exposed to uv every day even during the winter time so don't think that during the winter time is we we get rid of uv even though there is no sun the uv is so penetrating right of course not that not as x-ray and gamma rays but it, it really goes through the through the clouds goes through the atmosphere and then reaches the surface of the of the earth of course, during the winter, it's not as much, right? We don't have as much UV as during the summer, but we still have UV in the, uh, in the troposphere, right? On the earth from the sun. Okay? So the exposure, we're mostly, ex mostly exposed to ultraviolet. Maybe the exposure to X-ray is definitely is nothing compared to the exposure to ultraviolet, but the X-ray is way more aggressive, right? So you can see it's 100 times more energetic, let's say, from the wavelength point of view. Vestibule is not, right? So it is 10 to the minus 7, uh, four, to 4 times 10 to the minus 7 to 7 times 10 to the minus 7. Then comes the infrared. Now, now uh, there are some, um, there are some um, thermometers that now they are the infrared. They measure the amount of heat that your body is, is uh, producing. So the infrared is normally associated with heat. So that's exactly what... Um, what infrared is known for is that the heat is is the amount of uh, is the infrared light. After that comes microwaves. We most of us should have a microwave at home. So the microwave they act also as a radio radio electromagnetic radiation. So it's ten to the minus two. Other way to have to where we have seen microwaves normally is like this long distance uh, communication. For example, I'm right now in New York City and then I'm talking for the ABC right channel. And then I want to see what they are doing in Atlantic City. So I have to connect with, uh, with Atlantic City in, in New Jersey. So normally those communication, they are done through microwaves. Well, right now it's through internet, but even internet through most through microwaves. That's, that's the type of uh, radiation that is used to communicate from one center to the other center. Radio waves are for the radios, right? but also is for cell phones. They use radio waves for cell phones, a combination of micro and radio wave for cell phones. So there was a debate a while ago, and even I think that this is still, some debate is still running about like people saying that uh, cell phone usage uh, induce cancer, 
that can they can produce cancer well the answer or my point of view is that if you if you see what is the wavelength for radio waves and microwaves is 10 to the 2 10 to the 4th uh, 10 to the minus 2. So this radiation is, I mean, the wavelength is really large, so the energy is very small. The, uh, if the energy is very small, I mean, there is really no, it's not aggressive to our bodies. So even our skin can protect us, right, can protect our, our DNA from, from the attack of this radiation. Compare that range, 10 to the minus 2, to the aggressiveness, right, of UV, UV is 10 to the minus 8. So we're talking about a million times, right? So it's 10 to the 6 stronger, right? So the wavelength is, is, is shorter for UV compared to the wavelength of the, of the microwave. So are we being exposed to cancer uh, by using cell phone every day? Uh, in my opinion, no, because the, even the, UV, the, the visible light, which we receive from the sun every day, has more energy than the energy that is given by, by cell phones and other uh, electro-domestic uh, apparatus. Right? So uh, I would say no, uh, definitely the, the damage to our eyes, that would, be, that would be something to consider, which is totally different. Cancer effects versus eye effect. Eye effect is different because that radiation might damage our eyes. That one I do have to agree uh, because of the color, the intensity of the color. Right now, I don't know, you have noticed that now these days, uh, all the cell phone companies, the ones that the manufacturers, they are making that the, the screen, the brightness of the screen adjusts automatically depending on the environment where you are, right? If it's really, if it's really, if it's really dark, the brightness goes really low. If it's a really bright day, the, the brightness goes up, right? So it, it, is, it adjusts now better our environment to avoid damaging our eyes. That's a good thing that the manufacturers have done. Okay, so <clears throat> every radiation, as we were saying, uh, they are stronger or weaker depending on the wavelength, but there should be one way how to quantify the energy that is contained in the, for a particular radiation. So the energy is gain and loss. Uh, the energy is quantified using this formula, H nu. And the energy or how radiation moves was studied by another great scientist, Max Planck. He was from Germany, I believe. Um, he was studying the radiation. And then I'm going to give have like a, let's say this is the sun. Okay, so it's an ugly sun, but this is the sun. Okay? The sun produces energy. And it says that the sun produces energy in packets. So when we say like the energy is coming from the sun, this, the, the light is not supposed to be continuous. It's supposed to be in packets, right? So a system can transfer energy only in whole quanta, right? Or packets of energy. Of course, those packets, they move in a particular wavelength, right? As waves, but each packet is called a quanta. Later on, uh, Planck, he called that a photon. Photon, P H O T O N. Okay? So, <clears throat> and it moves like that way. So, it sends like pulses of the energy. And those pulses were called initially quanta. And then after that, quanta is the, how the energy moves. But if you are talking about light, then that quanta is called a photon. Okay? So, a photon is, the, is a packet of light. Okay? The energy seems to have particular properties too. That's, our, that's what uh, Einstein was coming up with, the photoelectric effect. I will tell you about the photoelectric effect in a second. He said that the energy is quantized. Uh, what does that mean quantized? Means that, well, it's coming in small, um, it, it has a definite uh, energy. Right? So for example, this particular quanta should have the same energy as this quanta. Right? They have a specified energy already. So this one, they, they all have the same. Yeah, they come from the same source. Okay. Energy is quantized. Uh, electromagnetic radiation is a stream of particles of photons, right? So because now we're talking about uh, light, electromagnetic radiation, particles called photons, which is the quanta, but in the case of electromagnetic radiation, it's called a photon. So the energy of a photon uh, would be equal to the Planck's constant, H, 
that's the age constant, which is Planck's constant. This is the value, 6 point times 10, uh, 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joules per second. And that's the formula. Uh, sometimes, normally frequency is not the best way how to express a, way, uh, a radiation. Normally, whenever they tell you, oh, what is, oh, I have a, a radiation. Nobody tells you what is the frequency of your radiation, no. What is the wavelength of the radiation? That's a more convenient way how to express or identify a radiation. So that's why in this particular case, it's better to express the energy in terms of uh, wavelength. So nu, we know that from a previous equation that C, right, which is the speed of the light, is equal to lambda times nu. Right? That's one of our first formulas that we were studying. So h nu, so if you want to express nu, nu would be equal to c divided by lambda. That's exactly what we see here. So this one would be equivalent to say frequency, c over lambda. So the energy of the photon would be equal to Planck's constant times the, the speed of light, but also a constant divided by lambda, which is the wavelength. And so that's how to express the energy that is produced in uh, or that is contained in a photon of light. This is now we go to Einstein. This is the discovery of Einstein. What is this, right? So energy has a mass. How did he come up with that? I'm sure that you have seen this formula. Even they came up with some t-shirts that they have this E equal MC squared as a logo, right? So it's very popular. This is coming from the photoelectric effect, photoelectric effect of Einstein, Albert Einstein. What Albert Einstein did, I will explain you briefly what he did. So he put uh, a metal, let's say that he had copper, right? I'm just gonna put metal. And then on this side, he put a fluorescent screen. Right? So I'm gonna say here F, F not for fluorine, it's just fluorescent. By the way, fluoro, fluoro compounds are not fluorescent. So I don't, don't associate that fluorine has to be fluorescent. No, no, something that is fluorescent that doesn't need to have fluoro. So for fluorine, it's two, two different things. Okay. So what he did, he was shining the, shining the metal with different radiation. So let's say like, I'm gonna try with radio waves. Okay. I'm gonna hit my metal, metal surface with radio wave. I see no, no effect, okay. So this is radio waves, R, that would you. I go up in energy, now I will use visible light, okay. So Einstein tried with visible light, it was shining it, and no effect, okay. Now let me try with x-rays. Okay, x-ray, he actually right, bombarded the surface with x-ray and he noticed some glow here. Then the question is like, what happened? I was shining it with radio wave, visible, microwave, infrared maybe, and I got no result. But now x-ray, Right, which is supposed to be light, right? So what happened? So for me to see the fluorescence right here, that means that some, something was hitting my fluorescent screen. So what Einstein postulated is that he had the metal. Metal is made of electrons, of course. Here I will draw one electron. So he says that when he was shining with the, with the X-ray, the X-ray promoted this electron to escape. And then the electron, this electron basically flew to the, to the surface of the fluorescent screen and then that's what caused the glow on the fluorescent screen. So that's exactly what Einstein was, was kind of like puzzled uh, by. So he said like, how come radiation can create or push electrons, right? be able if i'm able to do that that means that i have a mass i cannot push a table i cannot push a person i cannot push a, a chair if i don't have a mass a ghost can do that right so because you don't have a mass something that has a mass can have an effect on something that has a mass so in that case his result or his uh his theory was that energy which can be light has a mass and has a velocity Okay, so this is this is what what Einstein called the dual nature of light. That natural uh, light behaves as a particle, 
and also behaves as a wave. Okay? So exhibits wave properties and partic particle properties. Okay? So that was demonstrated by the photoelectric effect, is that it, how do you know that it has wave properties? Well, because it propagates in waves, right? It moves in waves, so it behaves as light. But that light also has a mass. How do you know it has a mass? Because otherwise, it wouldn't be able to push the electron, right? Like right here in the photoelectric effect. How can this electron move from here to here? Because it got pushed. It got pushed by who? By the X-ray. The X-ray was able to push this electron to the surface of the fluorescent screen. So if you don't have a mass, you can't push anything. So that was the, the result of the photoelectric effect, okay? So it's kind of abstract. Uh, it's difficult to explain, I mean, even by words or by, by, by me talking, but it is really what happened. Then that was the conclusion of Albert Einstein from this. Okay? So light behaves as a wave and also behaves as a particle. And something also very important that maybe you have not noticed is that how come you are able to do that with X-rays, but you're not able to do that with visible, you are not able to do that with radio waves. That means that not all the electrons are the same. The electron needs a minimum amount of energy to be displaced. You cannot just use radio wave. Radio wave has so small energy that they are not able to push. So even not every light has the same particle properties. So X-ray has a more aggressive, therefore it's gonna push the electron if that means that it has, it has, um, it has the energy that allows the electron to move, I mean, the electron to be pushed faster or, or maybe in a, in a more, in a more uh, visible way, right? So that's what, one of the conclusions of, of Albert Einstein. After that came um, Niels Bohr. He was studying, he focused on the hydrogen. Hydrogen was his main, his main concern uh, or his main uh, area of study was the study of the of the hydrogen for this theory so he came up with I mean well he studied this particular system continuous spectrum and also the line spectrum okay? so why is the continuous spectrum and what is the line spectrum right? so two different spectrums so the <clears throat> I'm sure that you guys have seen this experiment they show it a lot in TV and they also show it in some movies uh, you have a, a, a crystal prism right and then you are shining a, a white light, right? And then the prism decomposes the light into the seven colors of the rainbow, right? Well, five, six, seven, seven colors of the rainbow. This is what we call the continuous spectrum. The continuous spectrum will be the inciting, right? It, is, it will be that uh, this light that is going before to the prism. So it's a single color, what I see. What is the line spectrum? Is each of the lines, right? Each of the color after the decomposition. Okay? So that would be the study. That is what Niels Bohr was studying: is the difference between the continuous spectrum and the line spectrum of a particular uh, element. Okay? And for this, I have um, I have a video that is very interesting. I hope you guys I'm gonna lower the volume. This is a mercury spectrum. Uh, with so he has here, he was saying that here he has um, okay. So here he has the mercury spectrum, right? The mercury continuous spectrum. Street lights. So this may look similar to you, this bluish tint. So it has vapor. Now let's try it with has a blue color. In place. And then uh, what he is going to do, he's going to put the prism. And then you can see how it decomposes. Uh, this is what we line, call the line, uh, the line spectrum. spectrum. And you can see different lines here: a blue, uh, a green, a yellow. Right. So those are the most important lines that you see here. Nitrogen. Now we have nitrogen. Spectrum. Using this. We will see the continuous spectrum of nitrogen. And so this is spectrum. nitrogen. This by itself is nitrogen. That will be the continuous spectrum of nitrogen. And after that, he will put the prism, and then it will and decompose the light into the line spectrum. You see a number of lines. 
So you see now blue, green, red, yellow, and orange, right? Very interesting that, that each element. This is neon. Neon has a bright orange color. And when you put the prism, you can definitely see a different pattern of decomposition, totally different from nitrogen. This is hydrogen. And then you put the prism of hydrogen and you see other colors. You see here a blue, like a light blue, a tint right, of green, the orange, and the red color. Right? So each of them, they have that particular um, that particular color, which is um, a lot of I mean interesting uh, things. I mean, to I'm gonna share go back to the presentation. Okay, so going back here to the presentation, well, uh, that was the difference between continuous spectrum and line spectrum. That is really what Wonder Bohr, he said like, how come in hydrogen I can see, let's say like six lines, but then when I did mercury, for mercury I only see three lines. When, when I did uh, nitrogen, I was able to see like uh, uh, maybe 20 or 25 lines. For, for, for neon, I was seeing only two colors, many lines, but only two colors. What's the difference? What makes the difference between one element and another element that they give me a different, different color? Right? According to Rutherford, that doesn't apply because the atom is mostly empty. Right? So the nucleus, is the nucleus providing me that? I mean, definitely not because we're talking about radiation. The nucleus is not radiation. Right? I mean, the nucleus is the, is, the core of the electro, uh, is the core of the atom. So really it's the electrons that are doing something, which was incomplete for Rutherford. Rutherford didn't say anything about the electrons. So that's what he was trying to investigate. So he focused on the hydrogen emission spectrum we saw the hydrogen lamp, right, in the video. The significance is that, is that only certain energies are allowed for electron in the hydrogen atom, right? So he, after that, he discovered that every line is a particular energy that an, an electron can, can, can have, okay? So if you see a line, right, one line in the line spectrum, that means that that is a possible electron transition. What do we call an electron transition? Is the status of the electron. So for example, right now, I'm in the ground state. Ground state means that it's not excited, right? So the ground, the basal, uh, the base uh, state of the, of the electron, that's called the ground state. But then if you give some energy, that electron goes to excited state. That transition from the ground to a excited state, that's called an electron transition. So that electron transition, of course, can be many. So if we call it uh, energy level one, energy level two, energy level three, four, five, so you can have different electron transitions, right? For example, here I have my electron, I mean the atom, and then I have, let's say each of these one, let's say that this one is energy level one, energy level two, energy level three. Each of them has a particular amount of energy, but then an electron transition will be an electron that moves from, electron, from energy level one, to an energy level two, for example, that is called an electron transition. Can I do also one, two, three? Yes, definitely, you can also do a one, two, three. That's a different type of electron transition. Each of those transitions is symbolized in each of the lines that we have in the line spectrum. That's why some elements, they have a lot of line spectrum, right, line transitions, and then some other elements, they do not. Okay? The energy of the electron of the, in the hydrogen atom is quantized. That means that the amount of energy so it's defined. So if you see a particular color, that means that that particular transition has a given energy. So if I want to go from one to two, it costs me, let's say like 10 kilojoules. Let's say, right? I'm just throwing a number. From one to two, it costs me 10 kilojoules, 10. From one to three, it costs me 25 kilojoules. That energy that is specific, only 10 kilojoules, or the other one, 25 kilojoules, is specific for that particular tissue state. That means that the, that the energy is quantized. Is that any way I want to move, any way I want to do an electron transition, I need a, a established amount of energy. It's not random. I cannot just go from one to three, depending on the temperature, depending on, no, no, it is not. It is that energy that allows me to move from one to three, it is already established. If you don't reach that energy, you cannot move from one to three. 
Now, we are only talking about moving from one to three, but what about if I want to move from three to one? Can I also go back or can I go from three to six, four, five to two? Can I go back and forth? Yes. You can also do electron transitions to lower energy states, which is, uh, is the same thing, right? So it's the same, the same idea is that you also need energy, but you need to energy to move up. For example, if you go from energy level one to three, you need energy to absorb. What if you move from three to one? Then you don't need to absorb because you're going from a higher energy to a lower energy. So instead of absorbing, what you really need to do is actually release, okay? Going to higher energy levels, you absorb. Going to lower energy levels, you have to release. Similar to the idea of exothermic and endothermic, the idea. Not really the not really the concept, but it is Mo moving up. You need energy. Moving down, you need to release or to lose energy. Okay, let's continue. Why is it significant that the color emitted from the hydrogen emission is not white? Uh, that means that the the electrons one of the electrons is predominant, right? So one of the transitions is predominant right? because we're expecting having white color. White color means that you have all the seven all the seven colors of the rainbow. But the fact that we saw that the hydrogen light uh, has like a, a little bit of pink. I mean, if you, if you go back to the video for the, for the lamp of hydrogen, it has kind of like a pink, a purple uh, color a little bit. That means that that particular lamp or that element, hydrogen, is the most predominant transition state corresponds to a light of uh, pink or, or purple color. Okay? That means that that's not white. How does the emission spectrum support that the idea of quantized energy level? Oh, uh, yeah, definitely, because every line that I see belongs to one particular energy level transition. Okay? So every light is, is provided by that. They, but the, the question is like, why do I see all of them? Because remember, that lamp is under high electrical field. So I'm giving electricity to that lamp. So basically, I'm giving, okay, hydrogen, I'm giving you electricity, do whatever you want. If you want to go from energy level one to two, do it. If you want to go to an energy one to three to five to six, do it. I'm giving the electron of hydrogen all the energy that it needs to do all those transitions. See, the hydrogen electron, right? The electron of the hydrogen has that energy. It will do them all. So that's what I see the, all the line spectrum. If I only give the hydrogen a particular amount of energy, right? Not, not plenty, a particular amount of energy, then the hydrogen will only do one transition or maybe two transitions. But since you are connecting that lamp, that hydrogen lamp to the, to the wall, the wall has two, 220 volts, I mean, uh, sorry, 110 volts. So it's a lot of power. So it's a lot of power you're giving to the hydrogen. So the hydrogen is going to do any available transition. That's why I see them all. Okay. That doesn't mean that hydrogen will do them all at the same time. No. If hydrogen has the energy to do that, of course, you will do them all. But if you have limited energy, then it won't. It won't do it. Okay. The Bohr model, uh, this is just the intro about the Bohr model. Right? So well, all these studies were all crafted by, by Bohr. He, Niels Bohr, who came up with this uh, idea. Well, he basically was gathering all this information from all the scientists. All this particular uh, lime spectrum, continuous spectrum, they were studied by Bohr, but remember that it was a contribution of many, many scientists, right? The electron in the hydrogen moves around in only uh, certain allowed circular orbits. That was his mistake, as we will see later. He was saying that the electron only moves in circles. That was his mistake, right? So that's something that is very important to highlight right now. Bohr's model gave hydrogen atom energy levels consistent with hydrogen emission spectrum. So he studied every single line that he saw in the hydrogen emission spectrum. Why is that hydrogen energy spectrum? Is that collection of lines, right? In, in mercury, we saw only three lines, right? In nitrogen, we saw like 20 lines, different colors. In hydrogen, we also saw some other lines. So he only focused on hydrogen. So he was trying to give any, every line that we saw, he saw on hydrogen, one particular energy level, okay? so transition. So that's what he was studying. The ground state, which is the, as well, I was telling you at some point, the ground state is the lowest possible energy state of an electron, and he labeled it as n equal to one. Okay? n equal to one, n equal to two, three, four, five, so the, the number goes up. What is the maximum level? 
the maximum level that we have, and I'm, I'm going to tell you right now because we'll see it later on, the highest energy level is seven. Why seven? Because the periodic table has seven rows. Every row is one energy level. Okay? So um, what about the periods? No, the periods is not. The columns is not. So really the energy levels is every row of the periodic table. Right? So for now, that would be a good, uh, good thing to start with. Okay. So these are the electron transitions that are allowed for the for um, for the hydrogen. That's again this here where we model of Bohr. He was studying the hydrogen atom. So he, for example, he was studying the transition between energy level three to two, from four to five, four to two, and five to two. Can I do all the transitions? Let's say from two to one. Yes, definitely you can do that. Can I do transition from one to Four, yes, you can do that as well. Okay? Again, everything depends on the amount of energy that you have available. This is a more atomic uh, view. So we have different energy levels. This is, this is let's say, like this is the domain for energy uh, level one. This is the domain of level two, level three, four, and five. So you has you have different types of uh, transitions. For example, here I'm moving down from energy level five to energy level one. And what Bohr was saying is that the electron was moving in circles. So, for example, if I'm in energy level one, I was saying that, oh, I went up, I went out. It was saying that the electron was only circulating, right, in circles. Well, that's a redundance. It was just going in circles in this particular energy level. Same thing, if I'm having energy level four, so my electron will only move in circles, all right? That's according to Bohr in circles will be moving in that particular energy level. So he was right saying that the electron will only move in that, in that segment, that zone of energy level four, but he was wrong by saying that it was moving in circles because electrons can move in circles, okay? That was debated later on by the quantum mechanics. So anything that moves in circles definitely is not going to, at some point it will lose energy and it should collapse. So that was one of the arguments that the quantum mechanics theory was against the Bohr's model is that you can move in circles because if it circles, definitely it will lose energy, okay? So in theory, it should collapse to the, to like a pendulum, let's say like, what happened with a pendulum? The pendulum in theoretically will stop at some point. So that's what the, uh, that was one of the arguments that the quantum mechanics uh, model had against the Bohr's model. Okay. For a single electron transition uh, from one energy level, this is the this is one of the formulas, right? Since uh, Niels Bohr was studying the electro energy level or the electron transitions for for hydrogen, he used this formula, delta E is equal to this is the formula that we need for energy level transitions. This one is the Rydberg, Rydberg constant, another scientist, Rydberg constant. And then this is the energy level final versus the energy level initial. So with this formula, you can determine how much energy you need to transition from energy level one to three, let's say, or from five to two. Final, okay, so we will do an example. Here is the, the model uh, fits the quantized energy levels of hydrogen atoms. Why only for hydrogens? Um, it, Bohr basically study hydrogen because it's the easiest element. It's the first element of the periodic table. It's the first element of, in nature. It's the smallest atom that we have in nature. So if we recall from chapter uh, chapter two, hydrogen only has one proton in the nucleus and only one electron. What does that mean? That means that how is it different from other elements? Because in hydrogen, you don't have what we call electron-electron repulsion. Since there is only one electron, there is no electron-electron repulsion. Same thing happening in the nucleus. There is only one proton. There is no proton-proton repulsion. There is no, there is no neutron, which is another, another aspect for, for hydrogen. So the neutron, maybe even though it doesn't have a charge, but it has some space limitation, definitely, uh, a nucleus with, with neutrons is going to be more crowded than a, than a nucleus without neutrons. Right? So that makes a difference. Uh, it makes things easier to address, I mean, for Bohr. But 
nature is not only made of hydrogen. Nature has 110 more elements, right, today. So they definitely don't apply. So he used the smallest, which is a good, very good approximation. But then after that, the quantum mechanics scientists, they noticed that, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a help. I mean, it, it helps, but definitely the absence of the electron-electron repulsion or proton-proton proton repulsion, uh, definitely it makes, a, it makes an effect. Okay? So as electron become, becomes more, more tightly bound, bound uh, is energy becomes more negative. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so energy becomes more negative relative to the zero energy reference state, free electron. As the electron is brought closer to the nucleus, energy is released from the system. Okay? So <clears throat> what it means is that uh, if you have a, you have a nucleus, If you have an electron in this particular energy level, if this electron is brought closer to the nucleus, right, it's gonna release energy. So that's exactly what I was telling you before. Every time that you move up, you need to absorb energy. Every time that you move down, you have to release energy. Bohr's model is incorrect. That was one of the limitations because this model only works for hydrogen, uh, doesn't apply to the other elements. And then they, uh, after that, they confirm that the electrons, they do not move around the nucleus in circular orbits. Uh, after that, they came up with this particular uh, theory or idea of wave function. Wave function is an equation that tells you the, the motion of the electron, the probability. Everything is based on probabilities. So by Bohr saying that the electron moves in, in, in a circle, that means that you can predict the position of an electron, right? Because if you know that it moves in circles, you can predict what it is. But actually, you can do that. That is uh, one of the postulates of the Heisenberg. Heisenberg uh, uncertainty uh, principle is that there is no way how you can determine the position and the, and the speed, or you know, it's the position uh, of an electron. Because right now, I think that the electron is right here. Well, in that second that lasted me saying that, now the electron is not here, the electron is here. Or maybe here, or maybe here, or maybe here. So it's very difficult to predict when, where an electron is because it is a possibility. The electron can be here, can be here, can be here, can be here. According to Bohr, no. Bohr said circular orbits. So if I know where it is right now, right? Let's say that my electron right now is here, okay? If this guy moves in circles, if I don't find the electron here, it should be here, 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 anywhere in the circle, right? But that's not true. So that was that was a few things that uh, what they were doing for um, against Bohr's model, right? So there's nothing. It's not that Bohr was completely wrong. I mean, it was it was things that were really productive from Bohr's model, and then really help the quantum mechanics, but it has few mistakes that after that the quantum mechanics uh, scientists, they, uh, they fix. Okay, so what color of light is emitted when an excited electron in hydrogen falls from N, uh, energy level five to energy level two? Okay, so let's do this one. Okay, that's, uh, again, I will do more of this in the solve problem part, but I just wanted to start with this, uh, this problem. Okay, so we have this problem that says that um, the, I have an electron that moves from energy level five to energy level two. So but this is a representation. Energy level one, two, three, four, five, the electron goes from this uh, level to this level, energy level two. So for that, I have to use that Bohr, Niels Bohr equation for electron transition. Delta E or energy is equal to the Rydberg, uh, Rydberg Rydberg's constant, another scientist, right? Uh, Rydberg constant, one divided by the energy level final square minus one energy level uh, initial square, right? They asked me what is the wavelength, what, or what color do I see? The only way how I can associate a color with, uh, with the energy is by this equation. This equation associates the energy with a particular frequency but that frequency can also give me a wavelength. So 
So the wavelength, I can definitely see what color it is. Okay? The wavelength will tell you the color. Uh, things that I need to apply this equation, the speed of the light, 3 times 10 to the 8, and Planck's constant, which is 6.6 .6 times 10 to the minus 34. All right, so let's do that. So basically, what I need to do is combine these two formulas. This delta E is this, and this delta E is this. So this delta E will be equal to CH lambda to be equal to minus 2.178 times 10 to the minus 18 joules. 1 over n to final minus 1 n to initial, right? Do I have all? Yes. C is equal to 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. H is 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 uh, joules times second divided by lambda. That's exactly what I want to find out. Equal to Rivers constant, 2.178 times 10 to the minus 18 joules times one over, what is the final um, energy level? My final energy level is two, right? Because I want to go from five to two. So the final is two, two squared, four, right? Minus one over energy level initial. I'm going from five to two, my initial is five. Five squared, 25. I solve from this, it's going to be a, a lot of powers, definitely. Uh, seconds with seconds cancel out, joules and joules cancel out, see? And then lambda is going to be meters. Okay? So let me see, 3 times 10 to the 8 uh, times 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34. Okay, so this side is going to be 1.9878 times 10 to the minus 25 lambda equal to uh, 1 over 4 is 0 0.25, right? Minus uh, 1 over 25, that's equal to 0 0.04. That means that this is going to be 0 0.21, okay? 0 0.21 times 2.178 times 18 to the minus, sorry, 10 to the minus 18, this is equal to 4.5738 times 10 to the minus 19, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so since I'm, I am uh, going down, right? I'm going down, the energy is being released, right? So. That's why is the negative chart, the negative sign here. You say, oh, but I get a negative. Yes, it is negative because you're going from a higher, from a higher energy level to a lower energy level. That means that the energy has been released. Okay? So that's why the, the, the sign. So in this case, just ignore the, ignore the sign. Okay? So I'm going to lambda, therefore lambda. Is equal to well 1.9878 times 10 to the minus 25 divided by 4.5 minus 19. Okay, so times 1.9878 times 10 to the minus 25. So I have 4.34 times 10 to the minus 7 meters. That would be my lambda. Okay. So <clears throat> then I will have to see what is the, the range. I would say like it's kind of like a red color. I will have to see what are the, what are the ranges for, for, for the lights. Let's see in the book, we should have the, okay. 4.34 10, 10 to the minus 7, right? And here in the book, I have this. I have that 4, more or less, 4.33 should be around here. I'm kind of in the blue range, right? Indigo range. I should be in that range. So that should be more or less the color for, um, for for this particular wavelength. Okay, so let's corroborate and let's see what we have. Here, 
blue, right? 434, exactly what we got, 434 nanometers. Oh, what is that nanometers? Um, nanometers is 10 to the minus, 10 to the minus nine meters. Yeah, maybe I should, I should correct that. Okay, so that was, um, this is the meters, but if I want the nanometers, four times 10, four, 434 times 10 to the minus seven meters, I can multiply that. I know that one meter is equal 10 to the minus nine meters. Sorry. 10 to the minus nine meters is one nanometer, my bad, yeah. Okay, meters and meters cancel out. If you do this, co this conversion, 434 nanometers should be your answer. Okay. So it's nanometers wavelength, normally it's expressed as nanometers. Okay. Let's continue with the presentation. So if we do the same, uh, the same calculation, you guys will be able to determine that that one, that transition will be a green color, 486, and the last one is orange red color, 656. So definitely that transition from pi to two involves more energy levels. That's why the energy is gonna be higher, it's in the blue range. From, from three to two is really weak, orange red, right? So 657 nanometers. Which transition is the longest wavelength of the light? Yeah, definitely this one, right? Longest wavelength means less energy. So they're definitely gonna box this one. Good, now let's continue with the quantum model, quantum mechanical model of the atom, right? So we don't, we have to start with the assumption that we do not know the detailed pathway of an electron. It's very difficult to predict it. That's exactly what I was mentioning before, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle means that there is a limitation to how precisely you can know both the position and the momentum of a particle at a given time. So right now I said like, oh, the electron should be in Central Park. Okay, you go to Central Park right now, and then it's not in Central Park, now it's in Prospect Park. But the same way as it can be in Prospect Park, it can be maybe in Flushing, Queens, or it can be in Staten Island. It can be, can I predict it where it is? No, it is, there is really no way how you can uh, predict the position or and the momentum at a particle time. Yep. So this uh, equation seems a little bit complicated, but this one is only that there is no way how you can pr uh, predict the position and also the momentum. Yep. The momentum is the, I mean, the how fast right, it, it moves. Yep. So <clears throat> it's a, it's a, what, all what you can get is a possibility. Oh, uh, the electron was in central part. So maybe it should be after one second, maybe the farthest it can go, maybe it can go down to maybe Times Square, and then that's the farthest north or uh, south you can go. And maybe you can go to Lincoln Center, right? When, I mean, that's, it's a range, it's an approximation, it's a possibility. There is no way that you can predict a specific time. So that's what uh, they came up with this possibility. They call that the, the wave function. So the wave function is uh, the representation, the symbol is this, is the psi, psi Greek letter. So it's the wave function, and then the square of the wave function indicates the, the probability, the probability of finding an electron near a particular point in space. Probability, there is no definite place, time, position, momentum where I can find an electron. That was the mistake of Bohr. Bohr was saying in circles, so if it moves in circles, that means that I can predict what it is, right? Because if, 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 I, if I know where is the circle, definitely what is the, the size of the, of the energy level, definitely I can predict it, but no, there's no way how you can predict that. Uh, intensity of color is used to indicate the probability value near a given point. Yeah, that's exactly what we can, we can get. It's a probability because of the color of the, of the spe line spectrum. Like the line spectrum will give you a color. With that color, you can get an energy. With that energy, you can say like, okay, so that electron, if that electron has this much of energy, that means that the only distance that it can go is this one, I mean, right, this particular distance. But again, it's a possibility, it's really not final. That's exactly why we, they came with this particular model, is like uh, the 1s, which is an energy level, right? So 
this is my possibility. So my electron should be mostly concentrated very close to the nucleus. As we move from the nucleus, you can see that the shadow gets lighter, 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 lighter. I can see a tint, like a something around here. But you can see that the most of the possibility of finding the electron is gonna be right in the middle. Does that mean that the electron is never going to be here? No, there is a probability that it can be here. Can I find the electron here? Yes. Can I find the electron here? Yes. But where is it most likely I'm gonna find the electron? And most likely we'll find the electron here. But again, there is no way to predict it, right? So where it is gonna be? All we can get is a probability, which is what you see in this curve. This curve, it tells you, distance from the nucleus, most likely you will find the electron very close to the nucleus. If you move away from the nucleus, you won't find it. That is for that particular electron, which is called the 1s electron. Don't worry yet about what is a 1s electron. It's a, one, it's a type of electron that is a <clears throat> energy level. That, is, that includes the level and the sublevel of an electron. Don't worry about levels and sublevels yet. We will go that right there in a second. This is the radial probability distribution. So in this case, um, distance from the nucleus, most of it occurs at the very, in the middle. So that means that close to the nucleus, it can exist. Why is this, this one not close to the nucleus? Because remember, if an electron touches the nucleus, it dies, right? Why is that? Because the nucleus has a positive charge. The electron has a negative charge. If the electron gets too close to the nucleus, it will collapse because they have opposite charges. Definitely they will attract. Since the nucleus is heavier than the electron, definitely the nucleus is going to absorb. It's like a black hole, let's say. It will absorb that nucleus, uh, sorry, the electron, and will catch it. Basically the electron is, the electron is gone, okay? So that's why at the very close to the nucleus, you can't find the, you won't find the electron. The, the nucleus definitely will have less probability. So, but there is an average distance, right? The electron will definitely get a distance from the, uh, from the nucleus that will allow it to move. Because the electron, according to the quantum mechanic model, the electron cannot be static. Why? Because if the electron is static, it will be caught by the nucleus. It has to be moving constantly. In a, it doesn't stop. That's what causes that we all have internal energy because the electrons are always moving. Since they're always moving, they produce internal energy, the kinetic energy. Relative orbital size. Okay, so <clears throat> since there is a probability, right, or for an electron moving, that also causes that the, there is a uh, orbital size. Uh, that means that, okay, so my electron can only move in this particular region. Okay, that creates that this orbital Right, where the electron moves is only gonna have like a spherical shape. According to my wave function, this electron is gonna can move in this particular area here, here, like lobes, like two lobes, two balloons. So that creates that the orbital shape is gonna be about this geometry, right? This particular shape. There's another type of orbital which is is like this, like a clover something like this. So it is dictated by the wave function. The wave function dictates the, the orbital side. What is an orbital, right? So let's imagine the atom as, um, oh, the fridge. Let's say that's the fridge. In the fridge, if you open your fridge, well, not the, 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 the bottom, right? The bottom part of the fridge, you will see different shelves. Right? The upper shell, second is, no, in my case, I have one, two, three, four. Yeah, I have four. So we have four. So imagine that those shells, it, it, all, each of those shells is going to be one level. The bottom one is the first, the energy level one. Then the second shelf is going to be energy level two, energy level three, and energy level four. But remember that the atom, I mean, the periodic table has seven. So imagine seven shells. Now, Inside of this, uh, inside of the level one, I have what I call sublevels. I have two drawers, one for the potato. Uh, no, 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 no potatoes. You don't put potatoes in the fridge. <laughs> you uh, let's say like one for the peppers, another one for the lettuce. Right. So those divisions inside of that shell, right, or that uh, that particular level, is called sublevel. 
Okay, so those sublevels are going to be either what we call the, it's going to be located in orbitals. That orbital may be one shell, uh, one, sh uh, one division, one drawer has like a rectangular shape. Another one maybe has a rectangular shape. So that is what we call here the orbital size or the shape is that is the, how are these particular divisions or compartments, right, going to the shape of those compartments. Right? So the orbital is a wave function, of course. It, nothing is really, there is no walls, there is no balloons, right? So there is no, there is really nothing that will limit, oh, this is the end of level one. There is a wall there. No, there is no such a thing. Everything is given by the function, is the probability. The electron can move this far, that maximum right uh, distance that you can move from the from the nucleus or from the right or the electron can move that would be the end of that particular orbital picture an orbital as a three-dimensional electron density map yes so the 1s orbital the radius of the sphere that encloses 90 percent of the electoral electron probability yeah the 1s orbital the 1s orbital is um the first one the very first one okay now maybe i should explain this better on the paper okay so let's say as i was saying um the there is something that we call level right the level is right here the energy, energy level one this is all the domain of energy level one this is the energy level two and energy level three so inside of energy level two we have different divisions, right? So what we call the, this is the level. And after that, we have the sublevels inside. Sublevels inside of the level, okay? So those sublevels, right? As I was saying, at some point, you can have a fridge, okay? And maybe here you put a, a container like that. Here you put another container. Here you put another container. Okay, so I'm in an A level. So I'm still in N equal to one, well, or let's, let's say N equal to three. Okay? So N equal to four. Here I have more levels, right, down there. So I'm still in A level three, but then this one is gonna be called a sub-level. This is another sub-level and another sub-level, okay? The sub-levels, they also have, have names. See, in order to avoid the conflict, between levels and sublevels, so they don't want to call level one, two, three, four, five, and also sublevels one, two, three. They didn't do the same uh, with numbers, so they use letters, but they didn't use A, B, C. They actually use sublevel S, um, S, P, and D. There is also F, right? But here in this particular case, I don't have F. Okay, so the level is by numbers. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The sublevels is SPDF. Do can every level can have three sublevels? No. Some of the levels, for example, level one, only has one sublevel. Which is the sublevel S. The sub the level two only has two sublevels. The the S and the P. The sublevel three has three sublevels. Sublevel four has four sublevels. Right? This one has S P D F. Five also has S P D F. Six has again S P D, and seven has also S P. Okay. I know, why is it like, do I have to memorize this? That one has S, SP, SPD, SPDF, SPDF, SPD, SP. Uh, no, there is what we call the electron configuration will help us with that. Okay. That is coming later. What is electron configuration? Is the way how I'm gonna place the electrons. So I'm gonna start placing the electrons. Let's say like I start here, one electron, one electron. Then I start putting electrons here, 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 one by one, filling up the electrons. You cannot put the electrons randomly. You cannot just put anywhere you want. You have to start always filling up the first levels. Once the first level is filled, then you go to the next one. Start completing here, then you go here. 
then you go here, then you go here, you go here, you go here. Okay? So this is, there is a sequence, there is a rule to fill out the electrons. Okay? But for now, I just want to tell you that you have levels, and then inside of the levels, you also have sublevels, which can be, in the case for N, is only S sublevel, for N2 is SP sublevel, for 3 is also, um, sorry, is, is SPD, for N is a level number, sorry, SP, yeah, SPD. This one we have SPDF, and then SPDF. Right? So for N level 4, and A level 5, right, which is, this is 5. Okay, so let's continue. Oh, now, <clears throat> what about these sublevels? Uh, the sublevels, each sublevel, let's say sublevel S, has different, um, has different, other more divisions? No. The S sublevel, right? We're talking about sublevels. Doesn't have more, only has one S. It's only one, one S. This is what we call the orbital. P. What about sublevel P? Does sublevel P has more than one orbital? No. Here you actually have PX, PY, and PZ. So sublevel P actually has three subdivisions, which we call, well, you can call it P1, P2, P3, but it, normally we call it PX, PY, PC. Why do they call it P, X, Y, and C? Because they are orthogonal. So that means that one P is in one direction, the other one has to be the other direction. Right, so like this, and then the other one's gonna have the Z. Right, so it's gonna be like more or less the three orbitals are going to be like this. Okay, so orthogonal. What about the D? In the D, actually, you have three, uh, five Ds, and the F has seven, seven sublevels. Okay, so, sorry, seven orbitals. So S orbital has only one, and then it's kind of easier to, to understand it, I mean, to remember that. So because it's, it's all odd numbers, one, three, five, and seven. Okay? So one S orbital only, three P orbitals, five D orbitals, and seven F orbitals, okay? So who are they? Well, if we go to the periodic table, that's why the first one has only, right, the first row of the periodic table, you go, it will have only two elements, which is exactly what it has only one sublevel, one orbital. Here you have more, that's why here you have SP for the second, right? The second energy level. You have more, ele more elements. You have lithium, beryllium, bor boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and neon. You have more electrons. Third one also, SPD. Okay? The fourth, um here you have i mean more electrons here right so these are the f this is the f row four and five four and five you have spd okay so let's see i mean as, as we move uh we definitely check how is the electron distribution um See, I'm just going to show you how we're going to do the electron uh, electron distribution. There is a there is a map for that. If not, I'll show you how to do that manually. I'm trying to find that in the book. Okay. Well, apparently the book doesn't. No, they don't use the Sarus. Unfortunately, they don't use the Sarus, but that's okay. So let's continue with the PowerPoint. Yeah, this is a longer, a longer, definitely a longer chapter because a lot of definitions here. Quantum numbers. What are the quantum numbers? Um, in the quantum mechanics model, they came up with some numbers. The numbers, what they tell you, they help you with is to locate an electron. Since you're gonna, we are gonna be filling up electrons, we need to, to identify where an electron is gonna be. So for example, my electron, let's say like helium. Helium has atomic number two. If it's two, that means that it has two electrons, right? So those two electrons, each electron 
should have a particular set set of quantum numbers. And then the idea is that both electrons, they can't have the same quantum numbers. They have to be different. Not all of them. You can share some, some numbers in common, but not all of them can be identical. Right? So basically the quantum numbers, which are four, uh, they localize the electron. Okay? So the first one is the principal quantum number, n, which is the energy level. Second is the angular momentum quantum number, L, which is the subshell. Right? So, right? so the subshell is what I was telling you. Remember the SPDF, that is. And then they, they each have a number. Okay? So the L. Next is the magnetic quantum number, ML, orientation of the orbital in space. The space is what I was telling you. Remember the uh, PX, PY, PC. And the last one is the spin number. So here that they don't mention it, but here the last one is the spin. The spin, uh, the spin means that the, the rotation, the rotation of the electron. Okay? Uh, when we do the spin, I will explain you, but those are the four quantum numbers, N, L, ML, and the last one is called MS. Right. So those are the quantum numbers. For example, this is the energy level one, only has one subshell. The subshell is 1s, right? So the 1s, the, the, the number, quantum number for s is zero. And the ml is zero. What does that mean, ml zero? That it has only one orbital. Okay? Number of orbitals, one. So <clears throat> let's do that separately on a, on a piece of paper. Okay, explain it, understand it better. Okay, so here. So uh, an electron will have a quantum number, let's say like the electron is right here. n is equal to one. So if it's n is equal to one, I know that the the n, the L, energy level one only has one subshell, right? That's what we want. That's what we know. Only S subshell. But I cannot write L is the second quantum number is S. Each of them they have a number. So the subshell and the ML number. If you are have an S subshell, the number is zero. You have a P subshell, the ML is one. D subshell, the ML is two, and F subshell is three, okay? So each of them has a different number. So if I say like S subshell or the F S sub level, so I should really write zero. Okay, now the next number is ML, right? What is ML? ML is the number, right? It's the number of orbitals that are contained. And the ML will always go from L to plus L. What does that mean, M minus L to plus L? It means that if you have an L zero, what are the possibilities for ML? From minus zero to plus zero. Right? Those are the possibilities. But who is in between? Nobody, only zero. Only zero. What if I have an L equal to two, which in this case is D, right? If you have L equal to two, which is the D subshell, right? D subshell. So the ML possibilities are what? Minus two, all the way to plus two. That means that who is here? Minus two, minus one, zero, plus one, and plus two. Five, which is exactly what I was telling you in D. Remember, D has, can have five orbitals. So this one is going to be D1, D2, D3, D4, and D5. What if I have a subshell L is equal to three, which, which belongs to F subshell? That means that the ML is going to go from minus three all the way to plus three. 
So how many? Minus 3, minus 2, minus 1, 0, plus 1, plus 2, and plus 3. How many orbitals? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. Okay, so my ML number should go from minus L to plus L. And the last one, which is the spin, it should be plus one half or minus one half. What is that, right? What is plus and minus one half? Um, the electrons, they, right, we were saying that the, the, let's put it in this way. These are the shells, right? One, two, three, four. Each shell will have their own subshells, which can be S, P, right, S, P. So inside of S, P, right, at least S only has one orbital, which is a spherical. P, the shape of P is this shape. The shape of D is this shape. F has a different shape, but right now let's focus on that, okay? It's only one of these, only one orbital. P can have three orbitals. Uh, D can have five orbitals, right? So uh, we, were, we said that already. And F can have seven. So each orbital can allocate a maximum of two electrons, two electrons in each orbital, maximum. Can I have one? Yes. But you cannot have three. You cannot have four. Only one or two. Now, how do these orbitals, right, survive? Right? So I let's say that I have the p orbital, and then I have two electrons there. How can these two electrons survive if I know that there is electron electron repulsion? How can these electrons right, survive in such a small space? Well, the electron has a property which is called the electron spin. What does that mean, electron spin? They will spin in a different direction. Remember, um, maybe most of us haven't taken physics yet, but an, a charge, let's say an, a, an ion, let's say like an anion or a cation, a plus or negative charge, if that particular charge circulates or spins in a particular direction, let's say like if you have a charge that spins clockwise, that charge that is, that is spinning clockwise Spins, uh, this is counterclockwise, but let's say like this one is clockwise, right? If it spins clockwise, right, according to this clockwise, it will generate a magnetic field in, in one direction. If you do it counterclockwise, it will create a magnetic, uh, a magnetic field in a different direction, okay? That's exactly what the spin is, is that how can I have two electrons how can I have two electrons surviving in such a small space, which is the orbital, right? This probability. How can I have these two? I know that the electrons repel each other. How can I have electrons surviving in such a small space? Well, electrons can survive by doing this. One spins counterclockwise, generating a magnetic field. that is opposite to the magnetic field of an electron that spins in a clockwise manner. So what happens here? How come there is no electron-electron repulsion? Yes, there is electron-electron repulsion, but the electrical field is, 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 is the same, right? There is repulsion of the magnetic field, of the electrical field. But what happens with the magnetic? The magnetic is actually opposite. Therefore, therefore, they will attract. The electrical repel, but the magnetic attracts. So that's how those electrons can survive in such a small, such a small space. Is by one will be a magnetic field in one, right, one direction, and the other one will have an electric field in another direction. That's how the electrons can survive in such a small space. How can I determine which one is plus or minus? That's exactly why you use this spin number the spin number they said are one half plus one half and minus one half what is this half and half meaning uh there is no meaning it's only it's a 50 percent chance that the electron will rotate clockwise and the other 50 percent chance will rotate counterclockwise 
is plus one and a half and minus one and a half. Can I have two electrons rotating or spinning in the same direction? No, you cannot have that because definitely there will be repulsion. Repulsion from the magnetic, uh, magnetic field and also repulsion from the electric, electrical field, right? So they will repel, so they cannot survive in the same orbital. For you to have them in the same orbital, electrons, you already have the, 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 the penalty of having two negatives, two negative charge. If you already have the, the electrical repulsion. How can you compensate this electrical repulsion by putting an electrical, uh, sorry, a magnetic, uh, a magnetic, um, feel that they can coexist. Now they can coexist because they have opposite, opposite magnetic, right, magnetic fields. Okay, so that is the explanation for DMS. What is DMS? Uh, very important, uh, normally for a scientist to explain the spin. What is the electrical spin? It's a property of an, of an electron that uses to survive in a small space with another electron. There is no other way how you can have two electrons in the same space. The, the only reason is because you have two electrons in a different rotation. That different rotation creates a diff, uh, opposite magnetic fields, and the opposite magnetic fields definitely they will attract. Okay, so let's continue. And that is the, the quantum numbers, right? The, all these quantum numbers that we have here. For the F, you see, the F has how many mLs, how many orbitals? One, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. The D has five, the P has three. Okay. Exercise, for quantum, for principal quantum level three, determine the number of allowed subshells, different, different value of L, and give the designation value. Uh, Okay, so this one, there is, to be honest, there is also a formula, but uh, here, N, right, is equal, I think was equal to three, right? The, for L should be equal to N minus one, the maximum number. So it will be from zero to N minus one. But the disadvantage is that this only applies up to the energy, energy level five, Yes, only applies to energy level four. After that, no. Okay, so that means that energy level three, that means that you can have sub level zero, two, one, and two. Okay. Because in this case, n minus one is three minus one is equal to two. So you can have zero, one, two. What if I have an energy level equal to four? That means that I can have L, I can have zero, one, two, and three, right? Because my maximum is N minus one, right? N minus one in this case would be three. That doesn't apply for N is equal to five because if it's, it's N equal to five, that means that you will have zero, one, two, three. Uh, oh no, actually, yeah. No, it will be four. There is no, there is no, there is no L4. Right, because we know that L L zero is S, L one is P, L two is D, and L three is F. There is no nothing. Theoretically, because remember the paper can tolerate anything. There is S P D G H, but these guys they don't exist. In realistically, they don't exist. There is a reason, of course. I mean, in chemistry, is always a reason. Um, the reason is this, is that remember that every time, every time uh, there is a new subshell, the subshell the size increases. The S is this small, the P is this small, the D is that big, the F is another shape. Right? We will see the shapes. So what will be the next size for the G? The next size for the G would be like, right? Or maybe more, I don't know. I don't know the, the size. What happens when, if you have huge orbitals in the atom? What happens if you like put a lot of orbitals there? So at some point, you will be so far from the, from the nucleus 
right? This is your nucleus, remember. This electron will be so far from the nucleus that the nucleus will not be able to hold it. Remember, the electrons, even though they move here, right, in different types of orbits, right, there is no way how to predict it, but they only move around here. Why? Because the nucleus is basically holding the leash. The nucleus will say to the electron, okay, you move wherever you want, but only in your energy level and your energy sub-level. That's all I, I request from you. How can the nucleus control that? Because the nucleus has the plus charge. The plus charge will, will control the negative charge, right? This one will move, but the, the, the nucleus will say like, okay, stop, don't move farther away because I'm, I'm holding you, I'm, I'm taking, right? I'm holding with my charge. The more that you move away from the nucleus, the weaker is gonna be the effect of the nucleus. The nucleus will say like, I can't control you. Let's say that this one is, will be like a 16 year old kid. And this one will be a five year old kid. This one is a five year old kid and this one is a 16, 17 year old kid. Who can you control more? You can control more the five year old kid. This one, no, this one is the 17 year old kid. So definitely you cannot control it. It's, it's more difficult to control it, okay? So who is, I mean, is this is gonna have more problems to control it because it's farther away from the nucleus. So what happened with the electron? The electron eventually escapes. So that is exactly what the nucleus doesn't want. Why the nucleus doesn't want that? Because remember that the number of protons and the number of electrons, they have to be equal. If you have 10 protons, you need to have also 10 electrons. But what happens if you have 10 and nine? Then you create an uh, instability in the, in the atom. That's what the nucleus doesn't want. So to prevent that, the atom cannot just keep growing. You cannot just have larger and larger uh, uh, orbitals. That's why at some point, the atom says enough is enough. Don't grow more because if you guys grow more, I cannot control you. So that's why at some point, these are the only four orbitals that are allowed in the atom, right? Okay, so the problem was saying like, what are the, let's go back to the, the problem. Okay. The principal quantum number, energy level three, determine the number of allowed subshells. Okay, so we say that it can be zero, one, and two, right? So the subshell zero is equal to the S, this one is the P, and this one is the D. I give the designation for each. Three, yeah. Three S, three P, and three D. Yeah, I forgot that. So since you have N three, so they receive the nomination. Three S, right? Three S, three P, and three D. Yeah, that's that's also something that I forgot to mention. Right? So every 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 shell. I'll do that here. Okay. We were saying that the level one, right, can have the subshell zero, right, which is S. The sublevel two can have L zero, zero, and one. That means that you can have S and you can also have P. Now the question is like, is this S the same thing as this S? No. This one is the S of the level one. This one is the S of the level two. How can I distinguish the S of the level one with the S of the level two? By putting one S, okay? How can I differentiate this one thing? I will put two S. If you go to N3, you will have L is equal to zero, one, two. That means that you can have S, P, and D. How can, how can I differentiate between this P and this P? They're all both P, yes. But this one is a three P, sorry, two P, and this is a 3P. This is also a 3D, okay? So the subshells, they also need the shell. The subshells need the shell also nomination, right? So I said 3S, 2S, 4F, 4D, 4S, 4P, right? So whenever you mention a subshell, you should also mention the, the shell. Okay? So that's why in this problem they were mentioning or they were saying uh, <clears throat> there is 3s, 3p, and 3d. 
is because of the they belong to level or to shell three. Okay, let's continue. For L2, determine the magnetic quantum numbers, ML, of the orbitals. Okay, so you have L equal to two, that means that you can go from minus two all the way to two. So minus two, minus one, zero, plus one, and plus two. Okay, and the number of orbitals, I can have five orbitals, right? So you can see here, this is one orbital, one, two, three, four, five. And subshell L2 is the D orbital, right? It's the D subshell. So that's what we have. Magnetic quantum number is equal to minus two, minus one, zero, plus one, and plus two. Number of orbitals, five, right? So these are the representation of the orbitals. Uh, this is the 1s orbital. This, this is for us to have an idea. I think in one of my drawings, I was giving you the, the shapes already. The s is spherical. 1s is smaller than 2s, and 2s is smaller than 3s, right? And it makes sense, right? Because as, as you move away from the nucleus, definitely the orbital size is gonna be larger. The, 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 the 1s is gonna be way smaller because it's very close to the, to the nucleus. This is the p orbitals. In this case, it's a 2p orbital. You can have here the designation 2px, py, and pc. Okay, so one is on the x axis, the other one is on the y axis, and this one is on the z axis. This is the d orbitals, Clo uh, clover uh, clover leaf, right? Except this one. Say, so like, what is this? Right? Yeah, when I was student, I also wonder what is that. Again, remember, these are all wave functions. So they are equations that they say, like, how far the electron can move. Remember, all these balloons, you see it as balloons right now, but they are really uh, equation, representation of the equation. And this is the F, very crazy shapes. Okay? This is the F orbitals. So they have this particular shapes and you might you might say like why is it almost no contact in the center the same thing I saw it here there is almost no contact the contact is reduced in the center because remember in the center is the nucleus you don't want to be close to the nucleus here's the nucleus here's the nucleus here's the nucleus there is nothing close to the nucleus yeah definitely makes sense that there's nothing close to the nucleus remember nobody wants to be close to the nucleus why? Because if the electron goes too close to the nucleus, it will collapse. And basically it dies, right? We, it, you lose that electron. Electron spin, that's uh, the last quantum number I was explaining right, right before going through the other quantum numbers. The MS number can be plus one and a half and minus one and a half. Here is what comes the Pauli exclusion, exclusion principle. In a given atom, no two electrons can have the same set of four quantum numbers. An orbital can hold up to two electrons and they might have opposite spins. That's the one that I was telling you that one should rotate or spin clockwise and the other one quantum clockwise. So you, uh, the magnetic fields, they, they, uh, they attract. History of the periodic table. So we're entering the last part. Uh, well, the, the, we're close to more than half of the chapter, very long chapter. Uh, <clears throat> They organize the electrons uh, based on the, sorry, the, in, in the periodic table based on the electron properties. Okay? So first Mendeleev, uh, he came up with a, a way how to organize the, the, ele the elements based on the chemical properties. For example, oh, these are mostly gases, I will put them here. These are mostly metals, I will put on the left, no metals on the right. Oh, these ones are very reactive with oxygen. Okay, so I will put it in this column. They have uh, some corrosive uh, properties. I will put in another column. So that's what Mendeleev um, uh, started with by putting affinity, I mean, in terms of properties of the elements. Then came the scientist, Aufbau. Aufbau said, like, as protons are added one by one to the nucleus, the electrons are added to nitrogen orbitals. So that means that the electrons have to be added to the electron shell, I mean to the organization. So that's what we were going to, going to explain right here. What are, what are these principles? The principle first, the Pauli, is that two electrons cannot have four quantum numbers, N, L, ML, and then MS. Okay? 
So if you have an electron here, let's say this electron and this other electron, they can have all four numbers identical. They should be at least different in one. Okay? So in this case, they will be different in the n quantum number. Why? Because this one is in shell in, in level three and this one is in level four. So just to start with, this one is in 4p and this one is in 5p. Oh no, sorry, 3p and this one is in 4p. So right now, they, are, they follow the Pauli exclusion, the Pauli exclusion principle. This one is N3 and this one is N4. Good. What if now I have this other electron? This one is 3s. Okay, good. Maybe their N number is the same, but the L number is different because the L number here is zero for S and the L number here is one for P. So these two follow the Pauli exclusion principle. Okay. Now, what if I have P here and here I have another electron and this electron is in PXY? Yeah, they are in the same shell level. So the energy level is three. The same sub level, energy level is going to be one right for p but this one is in px and this one is in py so that means that the ml number is going to be different for these two electrons what if i have two electrons another one here and if this also happens to be 3px what happens now with this electron well they have the same n they have the same l and they have the same ml so the only, re the only way how these guys can coexist is that this electron has to be plus one half for the MS, and this one has to be minus one half for the MS, okay? They have to be different in, at least in one of the quantum numbers. Now, the alpha principle, right? He says that whenever you complete or fill up electrons, right, in an atom, you always have to start from the bottom and always one at a time. I cannot put 10 electrons at a time, so I have to be one, two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then continue adding electrons one by one. The electrons cannot just be put like in one wave. You have to do it one by one and according to the energy level. You cannot fill up energy level three before filling up energy level one, or two before one, or six before three, right? So you always have to be filled up like from the bottom to the top. And also the subshells have to be completed in the same way. You cannot complete, you cannot complete P without completing S first. So same thing, you cannot complete uh, P before completing S, or D before completing P and S. It, it is a sequence of electrons. This is what Alpha was saying, is that you have to complete it based on the energy and also one at a time. Uh, oxygen, an oxygen atom has an electron arrangement for two electrons is one, one subshells. Two electrons in two subshells, see? So you have to put the electrons in subshell 1S first, then in the 2S subshell, and then in the 2P subshell. So you have to go electron level by level in energy. So from lower energy to higher energy. And then here's where I'm gonna come up with the, with the filling up the electrons. But let's continue here. What is this 1s2, 1, uh, 2s2, 2p6? So <clears throat> I'm gonna do the Xarus for you guys to, guys to have an idea. This is how I learned it. So 1, S, 2, S, P, right? Those are my energy levels, right? 1S, and this is what they allow me. 1S can only have S, 2, S, 3, S, P, D, 4, S, P, D, F, 5, S, P, D, F, 6, S, P, D, and 7, S, P, okay? So just remember that. Okay, so now, remember how many electrons we said that we can have in S subshell, right? S subshell, you can have only one orbital, right? It's only one orbital. 
each orbital can fit two electrons because only one orbital. Let me write that here. S can only have one orbital. I'm going to abbreviate it as orb. And then each orbital can have two electrons maximum. Since I have one orbital, I can only have two electrons in each S sublevel. P. How many orbitals can I have in P? In P, I can have three, right? Remember that we said like for S, you can have one orbital, for P, three, and then for D, five, and for F, seven, right? It's odd numbers, one, three, five, seven. So in P, you can have three orbitals, which are, we label it as PX, PY, PZ. Two, orbit, uh, two electrons per orbital, two electrons times three, six electrons, okay? In P sub level, you can have a maximum of six electrons. D, D can hold, can have five orbitals. Five times two, 10 electrons. So that means that the D orbital, the D subshell, can have 10 electrons. It's not the D orbital that can have the 10 electrons. Each orbital can have maximum two. It's only that that subshell can have five orbitals. Five orbitals times two, 10 electrons. And the F is seven orbitals, right? Seven times two, 14 electrons. So these subshells, they can hold two electrons for D, six electrons for, uh, for P, 10 for D, and 14 for F. Okay, now how do I do this, right? So for the electron configuration, you are going to do it this way. You're going to do uh, 1S, it goes this way. 1 is, oh no, it goes this way. This is how it goes. Walk this arrow, then you go this arrow, then you go this arrow, this arrow. Always cross. That's how you're gonna fill out the electrons. Okay. What does that mean this particular system? I'm gonna make it far, far. That's how you're gonna complete the electrons. So how can you do that? So that means that first you have to complete one S. After that, who do you complete? Two S. How many electrons can you have in S? Remember, two electrons, right? How many electrons can you have in two? Two S, also two electrons. Next, two P, two P six. Why six? Because six, I can have six electrons. After two P six, who comes? Three S two, right? After three S two, there is nobody else here, so they can go to the next, to the next row. So three P six. How do I know this is 3P6? Because it's 3P6, right? 3P, and then I know that P can hold up to six electrons. Who comes after that? 4S2. After that, nobody. Then go to the next, right? The parallel. Then it's 3D10, uh, 4P6, 5S2, 4P6, 5S2, nobody. Next is 4F14. After that, 5D10. Um, here, right? After that, 6P6, 7S2, 5F14, 6D10, and 7P6. This is what we call the electron configuration. How do I use it, right? So let's let's do that now. So let's say that they, they tell me, do the electron configuration of, let's do a medium atom, silicon. Silicon, right? The atomic number of silicon is 14. What does that mean? That means that we have to complete as many electrons. This is the entire series. You don't have to do this series all the time. You only complete it until you reach the number of electrons, which is 14. In my case, it would be two, four, 
2, 4, 10, 12 here. I will stop somewhere here. So until I complete 14 electrons, remember 14, that means that number of electrons is equal to 14, right? So I will start here. The first one is 1 is 2, right? After 1 is 2, 2 is 2. So far I go four electrons, right? After 2 is 2, 2 P6. After that, 3 is 2. So far I have 2, 4, 10, 12. How many more do I need? I have 10, right? I have 12 so far. I need two more. Then the next one, right? After 4 is 2, after, sorry, after 3 is 2, the next one should be 3 P6. But I can't put 3 P6. Why? Because if I put 3 P6, I will have 2, 4, 10, 12, 18. I don't want 18, I only want 14. Then don't put all the 3 P6. What you're going to put is 4, 10, 3 P2. Okay? Remember, these numbers, they are the maximum number they can, they can allocate. The fact that here is a 6, that doesn't mean that you have to put always 6 now. It's, you can put P1, P2, P3, P4, P5, P6, up to P6. Same thing here. You don't have to write D10. It can be 3D1, D2, D3, D4, all the way to D10. Okay. So that is what I, that is what basically what we have for the, uh, for the electron configuration of silicon. Okay. So <clears throat> how they are organized, right? I mean, it is, this is what we call, I mean, the completing always the first orbitals, the lower energy following the off-bow principle. You have to start with the ones that are at the very beginning, the lower energy. That's why I do S, S, P, S. Some cases they do it like this. I mean, they do a different way. That's why this is called the Sarus. Why Sarus? Because it looks like a, like a saw, right? Like, like a zigzag line. You remember this tool, right? For cutting, for sewing. So that is what they call it, the Sarus rule so you can have that handy the book doesn't have it but i would definitely recommend you to research or to find about the sarus sarus s-a-r-r-u-s okay. so how do the electron configuration there is another way how do the electron configuration which is the abbreviated in the abbreviated electron configuration what you guys have to do is you have to um, use the noble gases. Noble gases, what you do is noble gases, they always end in P6. Okay, so in this case, I will have this electron configuration and then I will target any P6. Well, any, I would say like NP6, or if you find uh, 1S2. Or because one is two is helium. Helium is the is this noble gas, helium. Helium doesn't have a P6. This one is P6. This is one is two P6, three P6, four P6, five P6, six P6. How come there is no seven P6? Well, because we don't have that many. Uh, actually, there should be. Because the actinides are here. Well, now the, the, the periodic table is growing so much that definitely it's going to be difficult, but it is 2P6, 3P6, 4, 5, 6P6. So radon should end in 4P, in 6P6. And the periodic table also tells you how many electrons you have. For example, here, that means that you have two electrons in, the, in that particular. So here you have two electrons in the first shell and eight electrons in the second shell. Here you have two electrons in the first shell, level one, eight electrons in the second shell, eight electrons in the third shell. Here also two electrons, eight, 18, eight. Okay? So this is, what, this, is, this is what these numbers mean, is that how many electrons you have in each, each shell. That's what it says here, electron configuration. Okay? I mean, definitely they are not gonna write all the 1S, 2S, P6, 3D10, no. They cannot write all, there is not enough space. So they do it by numbers. So going back to the abbreviated version of the electron configuration, it is by, um, do you find any 1s2? 
or the P6. In this case, I go, I read from right to left, and I find, I have to find either a P6 or an S2. One S2. In this case, I found this. Who is 2P6? I was saying that this one is 2P6, right? It's neon. So what I will do, I will cut it here. Who is this guy? This guy is neon. So I will say neon, neon 10. Okay, so I'm abbreviating all that, which you, this is neon. And then after that, I will write 3S2, 3P2. Okay? This is one way how you can cut the electron configuration, not to make it too long, because it will be one, two, three, four, five things. But instead of that, you can just cut it to neon and then write the, the, the remaining. What you are telling here is like, the electron configuration of silicon is the same as the electron configuration of neon plus 3S2 and 3P2. That is what you are telling with this abbreviated version. Okay, so again, I will do more example of this in the solve problem video. This video, yeah, is getting longer, longer than expected. Well, it's a very long chapter anyway. Okay, so here we have the uh, 1S2, 2S2, 2P4. Uh, Hans, uh, Hans rule, he says that the lowest energy configuration for an atom is the one having the maximum number of ampere electrons allowed by the Pauli's uh, principle in a particular set of degenerate same energy orbitals. Okay, so here is, here is what it, that means, the Huns, uh, the Huns rule. So whenever you are filling up uh, electrons in subshells that they have multiple orbitals, right? Remember that S at least is not a, is not a problem because S only has one orbital. Here, the same thing with 2s, has only one orbital. But p can have up to three orbitals. d can have pi orbitals, and then f can have seven orbitals. So now, how do I differentiate between them, right? How do I, uh, can I put all the electrons at the same time? Um, no, you have to put one at a time, and always do it this way. For example, in 1s, I complete first the up and then the down. In the 2s, first the up, then the down. That's how you complete the S. That one was easy because of the, they only have one orbital. Now let's see what happens in the P. In the P, how do I complete the P orbitals? First that. You might think that the next one would go here. No, but the next one should go there. Okay, on the next one. And then the third one goes there. Then once I run out of the empty orbitals, then I will start filling up the orbitals. That one will be the fourth one. And then, well, if you have the fifth one, yeah, the fifth one will go here, and the sixth one will go here. But here we're doing oxygen. That's why we have P4. So P4 only has four orbit or four electrons in the 2P orbital, right? So 2P subshell. So the 2P subshell only have four, four electrons, so that's why I put one, 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 and then three. Don't do this. I mean, don't try to do like one, two, and then one, two, no, that would be wrong to do it like that because somebody will always like, okay, so I want to pair electrons. No, you should not pair electrons. You should first do the amperes, basically the first coding of electrons, and then you start doing the second coding of electrons. Valence electrons are the electrons in the outer most principal quantum level of the atom. So what is the valence electron? For example, for oxygen, how many valence electrons do you have? In this case, for oxygen, you have two energy levels. You have 1s, 2, and the energy level 2, you have these electrons. Okay? It goes by the level. So I have two electrons in the first level, and I have six electrons in the second level. Be careful, it's not the last one. So it's not the last the last one, it's not the 2P4. It's the highest energy level. How many electrons do I have in the highest energy level? In this case, my highest energy level is energy level two. How many electrons do I have in energy level two? I have six, two and four, right? Two here and four here. So my valence electrons will be equal to six, okay? So in this case, it's uh, eight electrons. Why is it eight electrons? Because my highest energy level here is two. How many electrons do I have in energy level two? I have eight. So my valence electrons will be equal to eight electrons. What are valence electrons? 
the valence electrons, since they are in the outermost shell, those are the ones that are going to be responsible for the reactivity. Basically, those are the first soldiers that they are going to go to fight to form the chemical bond. If you form a chemical bond, the valence electrons, since they are the ones that are most exposed to the outside, they are the ones that are going to be forming those particular bonds. Okay? So that's why valence electrons are so important. How to find them is also very important. The elements in the same group of periodic table, they have the same number of uh, valence electrons. Okay. Why? Because they have, they, I mean, they have the same, uh, very similar quantum numbers. If they have very similar quantum numbers, that means similar, remember, similar. They can never be identical. They have similar quantum numbers. So for example, all these guys uh, in, the 1A, in the 1A group, they all have plus one charge because they have, or they have one valence electron. Why is that? Because they belong to the same column. If you go here, you will see that they have all valence electrons too. They have valence electrons three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. That's why they came up with this designation that this is the family 1A, this is the family 2A, this is the family three, four, five, six, seven, eight, A. So these guys are the 2S, the electron configuration ends in 2s, the electron configuration ends in 3s, 4s, 5s. Who are these guys? These are the D, 3D electrons, sorry, the 3D elements. What does that mean, 3D elements? That means that their electron configuration ends in 3D. That means that they can be 3D1, 3D2, 3D3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. See? Those are the 10, D, 10 3D electrons. Here, 4D1, 4D2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. This is the F block. That means that this one is going to be the 4, F1, F2, F3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, right? Why 14? Because the F subshell can allocate up to 14 electrons. The D subshell can allocate up to 10 electrons. If you can allocate up to 10 electrons, that means that 10 possible elements can be there. Element D1, D2, D3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Same thing for P. P1, P2, P3, P4, P5, P6. Okay, so they are all P6, with the exception of neo, uh, helium. Helium is the only one that doesn't end in P6. It is 1s2. That's why this one is this section for the noble gases. All noble gases they end in P6. All the halogens will end in P5. Here in this oxygen family, they all end in P4, P3, P2, and P1. Okay. This one ends, that one will be a 2p1, 3p1, 4p1, 5p1, 6p1, 7p1, all right? Determine the expected electron configuration for each of the following. Sulfur, okay. Um, sulfur is 32, okay? So let's do that as a practice. I mean, I did silicon already. Let's do one, a big one, barium. Barium is really big, okay? Again, I, I will do more problems of this, um, in, in the solve problem videos, but it just follow the same Sarus, Sarus uh, diagram. The Sarus diagram will definitely help you to do this electron configuration. All you just have to do is just follow the sequence. It's like a worm, it's like a snake, right? The, it's uh, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. So that's, that's the technique for the... Here for barium, they're using the abbreviated, they use xenon. Xenon is the previous... Uh, uh, the previous noble gas, right, before barium. Europium is an F, that's an F element, yeah, that's why it ends is in F, F7. Periodic trends, yeah, we're in this, in the last third now, officially, last third of this chapter. Um, this and electron properties, they give um, some trends uh, that they can be predicted from the periodic table. Those three parameters are ionization energy, Electron affinity and atomic radius. As I said before, 
besides atomic radius, we will also do ionic radius. What is ionization energy? Ionization energy is the energy that is required to remove an electron from a, from a gas, uh, gas atom or ion. Okay, so I want to remove an electron. How much does it cost me? So that is the ionization energy. There are some electrons that they like to lose electrons. For example, who? Elements that have very small number of valence electrons. For example, if you have only one electron, right, in your in your valence valence shell, it's very easy to remove that electron. What if I have six or seven, right, or, or I, I, I'm like more than 50% filled? That electron is gonna be more difficult to remove, okay? So, they have a value in kilojoules, right? Ionization one. In the case of magnesium, magnesium has two valence electrons. That means that magnesium can lose two electrons having two ionization energies. Remember, the, the, ionic, the first ionization is always gonna be easier than the second ionization. In this case, magnesium loses the first electron only with 735 kilojoules per mole. To lose the second electron, it needs 1,445 kilojoules per mole. So definitely the second ionization is gonna be way more difficult. Why is that? Because of the presence of the plus charge. Losing electrons for an ion or a cation, some, somebody that is already charged, is more difficult because there is an imbalance of electrons. Okay? So that's really the reason why the, uh, the second ionization is always the more difficult than the, than the first one. What about the third ionization? If there is a third, yeah, the third one is gonna be even way more difficult than the, than the second one, okay? In this case, you see, the third ionization costs 7,000, right? 700, so there is no correlation. At least here it makes sense because it's twice, almost twice, right? 700 and 1,400, almost twice. But what about 7,000? No, here no. Core electrons are bound much more tightly than valence electrons. Yeah, because in the case of magnesium, and then I will explain that with, because magnesium, the case of magnesium is easier. Uh, magnesium has an atomic number, of magnesium has an atomic number of 12. So magnesium is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, uh, 3s2. Okay, How, what are my valence electrons? My valence electrons are these guys, right? 3s2, those are my valence electrons. If I lose the first one, I lose one here. If I lose a, the second one, I will lose it here. To lose a third one, then I will have to lose this one. But this one, these are called, right? We say that these ones are called the valence electrons. What are the names of these guys? Now this one. These are called the core electrons. Removing core electrons are way more difficult than removing valence electrons. So in the case of magnesium, right, magnesium, the first ionization is relatively easy. The second one is still easy because you are still in the valence shell. But once you are in the core shell, that electron is gonna be way more difficult. That's what that slide was trying to say, is that the core electrons are more difficult to remove than valence electrons, right? And why do I want to know to remove uh, electrons, right? Remember that magnesium ionizes, right? So. Magnesium ionizes, so you want to make sure that magnesium forms that magnesium plus four, plus two. So I want to know how much energy do I need to produce, I mean, to go to this particular state, because magnesium chloride is formed by magnesium plus two plus chloride. So if I want to produce magnesium chloride, I have to make sure that I have Mg plus two. How do I know if I have Mg plus two? If I have enough ionization energy, to ionize magnesium zero to magnesium plus two. Okay? So that's why this theory is important. But normally, nobody really thinks of that. I mean, we always assume that magnesium ionizes into magnesium plus two. Okay, let's continue with ionization energy. In general, as we go across a period from left to right, the first ionization increases. So it's more difficult to lose um, Elements, uh, electrons in elements, it's more difficult to lose elements on the right than elements on the left, okay? Why? Electrons added in the same principal quantum level do not completely shield the increasing nuclear charge caused by the adding other protons, 
Okay, electrons are in the same place, the compacting level do not really shield the increasing nuclear charge caused by the Okay, so what they are trying to say here is that if you are here, the periodic table, remember the electrons are filling up this way, right? From left to right. One electron, one electron, right here. One electron, one electron, one, one more electron. You're adding electrons as you move from left to right. So what that slide was saying is that removing an electron from K, in this case, let's say potassium, is easier than removing an electron for arsenic, let's say. Why is that? Because the, these electrons, these electrons that were, right, additional electrons that you have here, they shield that electron. So that's why removing an electron for arsenic is more difficult. Why? Because this electron for arsenic is, is being backed up by all these other electrons. What happens in potassium? In potassium, nobody is, is shielding okay? because the valence electron is one electron. So who is shielding this electron? Nobody. That's why it's easier for me to remove it. For calcium, also easier. For this one, it should be easier. So these guys on the, on the right side, these are more difficult to remove because all these electrons are shielding that. Right? So the shielding of electrons is what helps to increase, so it's more difficult to remove the, uh, that last electron. Electrons in the same principal quantum level are generally more strongly bound from to left, yeah, left to the, from left to right. So the right, the ones on the right are more, are, are better, they have higher ionization energy. In general, as we go down the group, uh, the, uh, the ionization, ionization energy decreases. Why is that? Because the, the ones, uh, the ones that you are, the electrons you are removing are farther away, farther away from the nucleus. Right? So let's explain that in the diagram. Right? So let's say that we're talking about uh, calcium versus or magnesium, which is as big as 12, versus barium. Barium is 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So this is also 2P6, uh, sorry, 3P6, 3P2. And this one is 6p2. They are both p2s, but which one is easier to remove? They have the same shielding. Well, not basically the same shielding, but why are they, the valence has the same, basically the same shielding, but um, which one is more difficult to remove? This, if I want to remove that electron, who do I have to ask for permission? Nucleus. The nucleus, remember, is the security guard, is not gonna let the electrons go because the, the nucleus will want to be stable by having the same number of protons and electrons. So if I want to remove that electron, this one, as I said before, electrons have leash right, attached to the nucleus. So the nucleus will not let me remove that electron that easily because the, electron, the nucleus will say like, if you take that electron, I will be unbalanced. Here, in this case, the electron will be weakly bounded to the nucleus. It's gonna be really weak that because of the distance. So if I want to remove this electron, definitely this is going, it's gonna be way easier to remove, right? Because of the size. Because as you move down in the periodic table, the ionization energy decreases. As, the, as you move from right to left, also decreases. It's easier to remove this one. So I would say ionization energy, decreases this way, right? This is my periodic table. The ionization energy decreases if I go down and if I go, if I go left, okay? So if, if they compare me, who has more higher ionization energy, this element X or this element Y? Well, who has higher ionization energy? Okay, Y has higher, Y has higher than X, right? Because the trend goes like this, it's a periodic trend, to the top to bottom and then from right to left. So the closer you are here, that means that the easiest will be francium. Francium is all the way bottom, all the way left. So this one is easier than, let's say, fluorine. Fluorine is very difficult. Fluorine is never going to lose an electron versus compared to francium. Okay? And that actually does what makes the, this guy so reactive. Francium fluoride, right? The, the two opposite corners of the, of the periodic table 
uh, definitely they will be very reactive, right? Because if francium loves to lose electrons, that means that fluorine loves to gain electrons, right? So he likes to lose, right? Francium likes to lose, and fluorine likes to likes to gain. Somebody that likes to lose and somebody likes to lay, definitely they're gonna form a very strong, very strong bond. You would say like, why are you not considering helium as your as your right your element that is the most right the the corner because remember the noble gases are unreactive right well most of them helium is unreactive neon argon argon krypton is somewhat unreactive they are noble gases xenon they are is reactive radon is reactive too krypton I think there are some compounds of krypton but to be honest like helium neon argon no they are not reactive at all they are very difficult to make them react so that's why theoretically we we ignore we ignore these elements. So my corner would be fluorine. Why not hydrogen? Well, because hydrogen is really located here, right? because it's the 1A, 1A of the creative, right? So let's continue with the presentation. I know it's a very long lecture, but it's very interesting at the same time. I mean, definitely this is the, <clears throat> the heart of general chemistry one. This is the values of the first ionization energy, right? It's the first experience, there is the, that's the periodic trend, goes up and down. Explain why the graph of the decision energy versus atomic number is not linear. Why are the exceptions? Well, the exceptions are really is the electron repulsions. Okay? The electron repulsions, remember that in some cases you have subshells that have five, six electrons. So the number of, 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 the, of the electrons that are shielding the core electrons, right? The shielding electrons is not gonna be always the same. For example, if you go down in the sixth, right? The sixth row or the fifth row, sorry, the fourth row and the fifth row, you will have the F electrons. So the F electrons, definitely you will have more shielding than in the first row or the second row because the first and second row, they don't have F electrons. So if they have an electron, the shielding is gonna be different. So the electron repulsions are, uh, are, the, are the exception. Uh, sorry, are, are, is the reason why they are not linear. There's no linear correlation. And there are a few exceptions, for example, beryllium to boron and nitrogen to oxygen. So that the the energy is not is not the same. So where do, where do we see that? Well, here beryllium to who to boron. See, there is kind of like a, a small difference. Why is beryllium higher than boron when it should be the other way around, right? Or for example, nitrogen. Why nitrogen is higher than oxygen? It should go up. Right? Well, those are the exceptions. That's what they mean. Like, why is it not linear? Why is it not linear this trend? You have some up and downs. It's because of the electron electron repulsions. Okay. Which atom will become more energy to remove electron and why? Sodium and chlorine. Well, we said that the uh, electron affinity decreases as we go down and as we go left, right? Sodium, I think sodium is right here, more or less and chlorine is this way. So which one is requires more energy? Definitely chlorine requires more energy, right? Because it's all the way on the right side of the periodic table, chlorine. Why? Because it is, uh, it's all the, all the way on the right. Which more energy to remove an electron? Lithium or cesium? Cesium, cesium definitely. Because cesium is in the row or in the period six versus lithium is in period two, right? The second row of the periodic table, the sixth row of the break table, so definitely uh, lithium will require more. My bad, my bad. Uh, lithium requires more. For cesium, it's easier to lose it, so it, it needs less energy. Lithium needs more energy because it's more difficult to lose. Which one has the larger, uh, larger second ionization energy, lithium or beryllium? Lithium. Why lithium? Uh, because lithium has only one valence electron. Beryllium has two valence electrons. So if you want to remove a second electron from lithium, then that means that you're invading the core shell, right? The core shell. And removing core shells definitely is gonna be more difficult than removing valence shell. Beryllium, both electrons are in the valence shell. So that's why this is easier than removing some, an electron from the core shell. Lithium is more difficult. Okay, so I use your energies. Uh, here is actually the value. Core electron C, the first core electron, how much does it cost to lose the first core electron C? The, the, the value goes up really high. 
removing core electrons from 6,000 to 16,000, from 8,000 to 21,000, 11,000 to 27,000. Electron affinity is the second one. It's the opposite, to be honest, it's the opposite as the ionization energy. Now, instead of removing an electron, what I, we will do is like addition. How much does it cost to add an electron? Right? So now, instead of looking at the atom by losing electron, now you want to see how it gains electron. In general, as we go across the period from left to right, and the electron affinity become more negative. That means that it is, uh, the electron affinity, I mean, this, the energy is better for become more positive uh, in the group going down. Okay, so since it is um, more negative, it means that the, elect the energy, remember, is more, is more exothermic, right? So it is the value, it gains more energy or it releases more energy as we go to the right and as we go to the top. That is how the electron affinity becomes more negative. I know this kind of contradiction, right? So how can it get better if it gets more negative? Because we have to think of it as an energy. The fact that the energy is negative, that means that it's more exothermic. If it's more exothermic, that means that it's is some, somewhat is more spontaneous, right? It's, it's a good thing to be uh, exothermic. So let's think of the of a better, better electron affinity. Who has a better electron affinity? Fluorine, for example. Why? Because it's more exothermic. The value is more negative. So how do I go to a better electron affinity from left to right and from bottom to top? Atomic radius in general, as we go across the period, yeah, the same thing for atomic radius. The, the, the flooring is the smallest. So if we want to go for increasing, or well, let's say like decreasing. If it's decreasing, I will have to go from left to right and from bottom to top. That would be the decreasing size of, uh, of the atom. Okay. Effective nuclear charge increases, therefore the valence electrons are drawn closer to the nucleus, decreasing the size of the atom. Okay, so that's across the period. Uh, it means that the nuclear charge increases. Uh, we have more. We have more. Um, we have more protons, but we are still in the same in the same shell. So that's why the effective nuclear charge increases. In general, atomic radius increases in going down of a, of a group, right? Increases going down, decreases going up. Orbital sizes increase in successive principal quantum levels. Yeah, this is the size of the atoms, right? This is the atomic radius. So lithium, beryllium, normally the smallest atom should be fluorine. This one is the smallest atom that we have in nature. And the largest is cesium. Why don't we consider francium? Well, normally francium is not considered because francium is a radioactive element. So cesium is the is the is the atom that has the is natural and exists in nature right concept check which one should be larger than atom why chlorine or or sodium they both belong to the same row so in this case sodium will be larger right because it's all the way on the left okay which one should be larger atom, lithium or cesium? Cesium, definitely, right? Because it's all the way at the bottom of the periodic table. Arrange the following elements, oxygen, fluorine, and sulfur, according to the increasing ionization energy and atomic size. In the case of the atomic size, because it's all the way at the bottom, I would say that fluorine would be the increasing, right? Increasing would be fluorine the smallest, um, oxygen, and sulfur. I would say sulfur would be the largest, so oxygen will be next, and then will be sulfur. Okay. And the ionization energy is the opposite, right? The opposite trend. Remember when we were doing the arrows, right? So this one is the smallest. Right? And the ionization energy will be the largest, right? So uh, sulfur is, which has a better ionization energy, it goes up, um, it goes up this way. Sorry, no, it goes up this way, the same way. Okay. 
the energy, the uh, ionization energy goes up this way. So it's easier to remove electrons from sulfur than, than fluorine. That's why fluorine is the last one, right? So that one is increasing ionization energy. Okay. This is, these are the alkali metals. Okay, uh, before I end this, uh, is the uh, ionic radius, right? In the case of the ionic radius versus atomic radius, Okay, what happens in an atom that loses an electron? Right? Let's say this is fluorine, right? So you have this size. Let's say that this fluorine now becomes, gains an, an extra electron, right? So to go from F to F minus one, this one has to gain one electron. What happens with that one electron? That one electron will create is a larger size. So normally the cations, sorry, the anions are larger than the neutral element. In the case of cations, it's actually the opposite. In the case of the cations, if this one is the size of sodium, the ion will be smaller. Okay? Why is that? Oh, that's, that's really look smaller. Okay? It's a smaller. Okay? The cation is a smaller. Why is it a smaller? Um, it's a smaller because of the the electron imbalance, right? So they say that sodium is atomic number eleven. So that means that here you have eleven protons and eleven electrons. So the volume of the of the atom is balanced. But what happens here? Here I have eleven protons, but only ten electrons. So the electron, the protons, are in advantage versus the electron. So that's why it shrinks the atom, I mean, the size of the ion. Why? Because now the nucleus has more force to shrink the atom, right? To the, in this case, the ion. In this case, it's the opposite. Now, if I used to have for fluorine, atomic number nine, nine protons, nine electrons, now I have nine protons, 10 electrons, right? Now it's an ion. So in the case of the ion, now I have to make more room for that extra electron. The electron has to be now is going to inflate because I have to allocate one extra electron. Extra electron will definitely give you more more room. Okay, so the ions they have the opposite. I mean, the anion larger than the neutral atom, and the cation is smaller than the neutral neutral atom. Okay, let's continue. We're almost done. This one is the names in the periodic table. Here we have the alkali metals. We have the alkaline air metals transition elements, lanthanides, and actinides. Those are the rare elements, right? So this is the F block. This is the D block. The D block are the transition elements. The alkaline earth metals are the 2A, but you can also say like these are the P2 elements. Sorry, S2. S2 elements, right? Because the electron configuration ends in S2. The 1A, they are called the alkaline metals because the electron configuration ends in S1. These are the P elements, right? And they are called, well, this particular is 7A is the halogens, and then the A, A is the noble gases. Metals versus non-metals, I mean, we have done that, I think in one of the, before, just to brush up a little bit. So these are the metals, this is a zigzag line, right? Moron here is a zigzag line that goes down here, right? So these guys are the metalloids. The metalloids have similar properties from some properties from metals, some properties from non-metals. So here we have some of them. We have uh, aluminum, right? We have silicon, germanium, arsenic, antimony, tellurium, polonium, and astate, right? So those are the metalloids. The non-metals are here. Hydrogen, even though it's located on the left side of the periodic table, but really hydrogen should be on this side of the periodic table because hydrogen is a non-metal. Right. The alkali metals are those elements, lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, and francium. I said that francium is radioactive, so uh, that's why normally we consider the lead alkali metals. I recommend you to watch in YouTube, uh, there's a nice video, what is the reactivity of alkali metals in water? You will see that cesium is really explosive reaction. Okay. So look at that, I mean, you have time, uh, alkali metals in water, the reactivity, and you will be impressed by the reactivity of this. 
most chemically reactive of the metals, yeah, because they are the, they like to lose electrons. If they like to lose electrons, that means that they will react immediately with oxygen or with any non-metal. React with non-metals to form ionic solids going down the group. Ionization energy decreases, atomic radius increases, and density increases, right? Because they have more and more element, or sorry, more electrons. Melting and boiling points smoothly decrease. Yeah, I think that that's, that's all for now. Uh, please let me know if you guys have any questions.